So our speakers today, uh, Stephen Litchfield, Liam Malone from Litchfield Law, uh, two excellent attorneys who work uh, and defend architects and engineers. So they're, they're like myself. We only work with architects and engineers, design professionals uh, who fall under that umbrella. And it makes for um, a very uh, narrow and a very deep breadth of, of work where you're just getting to uh, see design on a regular basis and all of the problems and all the risks that come with the world of design. Uh, their law practice ranges from reviewing contracts and design firm agreements all the way to litigation and defense of design professionals in disputes and insurance claims. And both Steve and Liam work with large and small a and &E firms uh, all across the country. Uh, Steve is based out of Orange County, California, and Liam is based out of the San Francisco Bay Area. So gentlemen, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for coming in today. Appreciate it. Thank um, you, Zach. And uh, you, you kind of, uh, you covered all the bases that I was going to cover in my introduction of us. Um, but yeah, like Zach said, um, all Liam and I do is represent architects and engineers, um, large and small. Uh, so we have a, a presentation for you guys today that we are going to try to um, hustle through to make sure that we can get to your questions at the end. Um, for those of you who might not be aware, uh, Zach and I, uh, over the last uh, six months to a, a year, put together a contract review guide for A&E firms. And today's presentation is basically going to be a high-level overview of, of what that document is. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about you know, how it came to be and, and why it was necessary and, and sort of the history of these types of guides and how to use them. Uh, we're going to talk about the basics of the contract review guide itself and, and how you're going to use it and not use it. Uh, and then we're going to also kind of give you some practical uh, negotiation tips because I know that, you know, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these contracts might not rise to the level of where you need an attorney to negotiate it, but it certainly can't hurt for us to convey some of the, uh, the tips and tricks that we've used over the years to, to uh, negotiate contracts on behalf of our clients. Uh, and then finally, we're going to answer your questions about the contract review guide. And if we have time, um, you know, specifics about contracts that you might have. So with that, I will turn it over to Liam. And real quick there, Steve, so the contract review guide will be available to everybody. If you don't have it already, it'll be coming out in an email with the recording. So as we start to reference this guide, um, it'll be made available to you in uh, a follow-up email as well. Thanks, Zach, and uh, thanks, Steve. Um, this is just a, a quick little more background. Steve and I have known each other and worked together, um, I think going on over 10 years now, and uh, primarily and almost exclusively working with design professionals. So this is it's a great opportunity and, um, that Zach and Steve have put together as far as that contract review guide and this presentation uh, hopefully will add uh, to the benefits that that guide provides. So uh, what the guide is, is it, like Steve said, it's an overview, right? It, it will provide uh, you with the information to help you identify the key risk points um, of the important contract terms that you'll see. Uh, it's not a comprehensive guide or instruction or step-by-step -step manual you can use. Remember, each time that you're um, engaging with a client and trying to work out an agreement, uh, the circumstances will be unique um, to that project and client. But the guide provides a really excellent, um, uh, uh, um, I guess, path to identifying the key terms that you will see across the board in each of uh, your contracts. So just make sure you understand that uh, it's not the uh, be all and end all for explaining how to negotiate a contract and exactly what should go in there, but it does give you um, an excellent, excellent overview of each of the key risk points that you will see in each of the agreements that, you, that you'll enter into. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And I think a good way to look at it is you know, a person like Zach, your insurance broker, they're, they're a resource that you can turn to. People like Liam and I are, you know, obviously attorneys who specialize in this area. We're a resource source that you can turn to if it makes sense. This contract guide is a resource that you can turn to um, both to gain a baseline level of understanding about contracts generally and to look specifically uh, into certain issues in more depth so that you have a level of understanding and can negotiate them 
accordingly. So just generally, the contract guide is organized in that it identifies nine separate areas of contracts that we view as kind of the nine most important aspects of a contract for design professionals. It defines those concepts. Uh, it focuses you on the key elements of that com concept and how it might, uh, might appear to you in a contract. And then it gives you an example of uh, what acceptable language might look like and, and in certain cases, what problematic language might look like. And one thing you're going to hear a recurring theme throughout this presentation is the intersection of your contract and your insurance coverage. Uh, and, and we work with, with Zach to make sure that the insurance coverage that your firm is paying for, uh, that you're not signing a contract that's going to somehow negate that. So that's going to come up over and over, um, making sure that your your contract is tied to the appropriate standard of care, which happens to be chapter one, which Liam will jump into. Yeah, so um, standard of care, this is, and it, it's chapter one for a reason. This is sort of the touchstone, um, both of liability, coverage, and how the law uh, will treat your services. You can think of the standard of care it also, if you want to get into more of a legal term of, well, what's professional negligence? And, and why is this standard so important? Well, and Zach can touch on this also, it, your insurance policy is going to cover you for negligence. It'll cover you for the standard of care. Right? Any allegations that you breach the standard of care. And it, generally, the standard of care is what a reasonably careful design professional practicing in the same discipline in the same circumstances would have done. So it's, it's, and it's an objective point of view. Uh, so you would have uh, testimony when you get into defining it, if you get a claim of this is the standard of care, this. This, this isn't the standard of care. And why is that important for your contract? Well, because you can have contract terms that can vary the standard of care. And what we really want uh, you to be able to have the, the skills and knowledge of is identifying where that language in your contract is that can affect the standard of care. For instance, you want to avoid certain terms or language like best or utmost or highest degree because what the standard of care is, if, if you want to think of it in a, as an analogy to uh, grading, right, like we're in school, the standard of care is a C, maybe even a C minus. It's passing. Uh, you don't have to be perfect. You don't even have to be almost perfect. You just have to be reasonably careful under the circumstances. And so that's, it's, it's such an important aspect of your contracts. And you'll find this language, this, these superlatives, not just in the term of the contract that's titled standard of care or architect services or, you know, consultant services. You'll see it throughout, right? You might get a term when you, you're looking at um, submittal reviews. You know, consultants will use, its, it will use its best efforts and utmost scrutiny uh, during the approval process for submittals something like that. Well, now that standard of care has been varied. So it's so key that you want to pay real close attention to any language and, and how the standard of care is defined and impacted by the contract terms. I love it. If I can jump in there real quickly. And so from my perspective as a risk manager, um, when we're talking about the standard of care, right, we're, we're thinking of liability as this spectrum on a zero to a hundred understanding that we never really have zero liability as much as, as we'd like to think. Um, the the standard of care is it's like you said it's our it's our C plus right it's our this is our our baseline and if we go in and we elevate it no matter how good our work is we run the risk of insurance companies denying coverage if there's a claim right so our goal always as a risk manager is we want to make it so you don't have claims that's just that would be the ideal if you do have a claim it very well might not be your fault. And when we go in and look at that, we're going to say, is our insurance coverage going to pick up? Are they going to write the check for this? Or 
is this something that we did something wrong? We elevated our standard of care. We, we made it so it's hard to apply coverage. And now we're going to have to write the check. So from a risk manager standpoint here, really, really, really important that we stick within what our policy actually covers. Because anything over that, even though you pay for an insurance policy, you might be stuck writing a, you know, a, a five-figure, a six-figure check from the firm to go fix this thing when that's why you had insurance coverage in the beginning, right? That's what we wanted it for. So that's the way I think about that. There's, yeah. um, oh, Steve, if you want to jump in, but I was just going to mention um, the, the negotiating tip or trick for this issue ties into what Zach just said. Your client is not going to want to have a potential claim that's not covered. They, your client is going to want your insurance to step in because that's a they they view that as a nice accessible pool of money to compensate any damages that for a A and E claim or a, a E and O claim that might come that, that that might be made. So if you're getting stuck or you see something and during contract negotiations that touches on the standard of care, raise the issue of insurability. We vary this. It might not be covered. It's in both of our benefits, Mr. Client, for there to be coverage. God forbid there's a claim. I love it. Yeah, very, very, very good points. And uh, the way that you can kind of utilize the contract review guide for this particular chapter is we have a list in there of some of the uh, the typical, you know, buzzwords. And Liam mentioned some of them. But if you're seeing, you know, first, first class, best, highest, um, or, or if there's any kind of adjustment to the performance standards, um, and sometimes they're buried deep in the exhibits, just, just keep this issue in mind. Um, and I think that uh, it's, it's important enough to spend time on, but we, we, we probably need to, uh, to, to keep moving unless, Zach, it looks like you might have one more comment there. Just a, one little asterisk to this. Sometimes we get asked by marketing reps, Zach, how am I supposed to market my firm if I can't say things like best first class, we're, the, we're better than everybody else? And it's like, well, that's a really good question. There, the only thing that I will say there is sometimes when we put out um, you know, an SOQ or we put out uh, a proposal, if that's going to get attached to the contract, then that's where we run in trouble of elevating the standard of care, right? So if our marketing team puts something together, we have you know, a statement of qualifications and it says we're better than everybody else and that gets attached to the contract, it's now part of the contract. We're we're in you know this gray area of our, did we elevate the standard of care? If we're if we're not doing that, if we're away, most and you guys tell me, but most attorneys I think would say you know marketing is marketing, and people will say what they say. So yeah, just don't don't put anything in your marketing materials that you wouldn't want to have put in front of you at your deposition or at a trial if right. you if you were to make a mistake um, because you know. We're like any professionals. Uh, we're not. We're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. So, uh, I would just say try to try to toe that line a little bit. But yes, it's a good point. You know, obviously right. we need to market. We need to advertise to keep the lights on. Um, so, just make sure you don't you don't you don't cross that line. Right. Um, and that kind of does segue into uh, another point, which is because we're so sort of specialized in representing A and E firms, we can go a little bit outside of the the legal kind of what we'd call the, the a legal box and talk more about more comprehensive risk management for design professionals. Um, so obviously I'm not gonna sit here as a lawyer and preach to you about how you should write your scope of services. Uh, that's you as a professional uh, defining what it is you are going to do and what you're not going to do. Uh, but the contract review guide does help you set some limitations in terms of how you define your scope um, how you exclude services, if that's appropriate, and how you avoid um, kind of what's becoming and, and well, always has been an issue in the industry. But, but when your client starts to ask for things that are, are just outside your scope of services, and then that kind of spirals into what we know as scope creep, and then you're looking at, um, you know, well, I guess I should have brought this up as an additional service six months ago, but I didn't quite realize it was happening until it was too late. And my contract says that I, I waived my right to any additional payment there. So the important things about scope of services are to define it clearly, make sure that there is a, uh, a basis for you to uh, claim additional services. And one negotiation tip 
that I can give there is it's actual it's actually a requirement of the business and profession code that architects and engineers have a basis in their contract for how additional services will be compensated. So if you ever want to fall back on that, um, uh, that's that's one way to do it. And then another way is obviously you want to you want to make clear with your client that you know you don't want any kind of dispute. So the clearer your scope is, the less likely a dispute is the more likely your client is to get a project that's going to run smoothly. So those are the kind of the, the, the high points of, of scope of services, but generally that's a, that's a practice issue that we would leave to you. And then just jumping into to chapter three, uh, very quickly, this has to do with extended relationships. Uh, long story short, this chapter focuses on making sure that we are not accepting liability for anyone that we shouldn't be contractually responsible for. Um, we want to make sure that we have what's called a, a no third party beneficiary clause. And I, I believe we provide an example of that in this chapter. Uh, that's important. And then we also want to make sure that anyone that we are not directly contracting with. So in other words, you know, if you're an architect and you retain consultants under you, uh, you are going to have liability for their mistakes. Um, and that's, that's kind of a separate issue that you want to make sure that you're passing down that risk. But, you know, we don't want to be responsible for the errors of the contractor. And the more, uh, the more clearly we can say that in our contract, the, the better it's going to be. And it kind of chapter two and three are next to each other for a reason, because your scope of services is your responsibility, just like your services are your responsibility, but you're not responsible for making sure the contractor uses the right screw to, to put together the drywall. That's, you know, that's an extended relationship that you don't want to be responsible for. 100%. And it's slightly off topic here, but on the topic of contractors, I can tell right away whether or not the contract that comes through was written for a design professional or was written for a contractor and the language that they use. And from our standpoint on the insurance side, it's incredibly important that it be written for a design professional so that it mimics your professional liability policy as much as possible. Contractors insurance, design professionals insurance are completely different. They, they cover different things. They operate differently. Uh, contractors can actually kind of uh, have broader coverage in terms of completed operations. And that's, we could do a whole nother seminar on that, but really, really, really important to understand um, that we're, we need to mirror our policy as much as possible. Right. That's a, that's a very good point. And just very briefly, if you start seeing, if they're calling it work instead of services, uh, if you're seeing language like free of defects, or uh, workmanlike manner, those are all big red flags should be going, you know, alarm bells going off in your head. Someone wrote a, a contract for a contractor and they just think it's their construction contract and they're trying to pass it along to you. Huge red flag, both in terms of the knowledge level of your client and your potential uh, risk, both from a legal and from a coverage standpoint. So that's a, a very good point, Zach. All right, chapter four. We lost I'm, your audio. I think you're on mute there. Oh, I'm back. Sorry yeah. about that, guys. So this is um, about who owns your instruments of service, who owns the actual design and the design documents. Um, the, the basis of the law without being altered through contract is any time that uh, you, an architect or a design professional uh, puts their uh, creative expression in a tangible medium, basically – you put down your drawings or even the building itself, right? Anything that's a tangible expression, that's copyright within the, that's owned by the creator. And your contracts will have terms in them about what rights the owner has in your design, in your instruments of service. Uh, what you want to be able to do is to identify whether or not you're giving away all of the ownership rights to your client, uh, and if not, what rights are being retained, and what are the penalties for the owner or your client taking your documents and taking your design and misusing it or using it without your authorization. 
So that in terms of risk and from the legal perspective, that unauthorized use is really what we're keying in on uh, from for Steve and I. Uh, secondly, be, well, obviously, because if the owner takes your design and go or your client takes your design and go uses it for some other project that you're not involved with or for which it wasn't prepared, you have a whole lot of risk hanging out there and no control over uh, that risk or managing that risk. So that that's from a legal perspective on the risk, the issues that you'll see. But also, it provides a great leverage tool in, in case you get into a fee dispute or your client is not really forthcoming with payment. It, if you retain the rights in your documents and you hold those rights until you get payment for your services, that provides you with a, a lot of um, leverage if you ever get into a dispute over payment. So this is um, one of the, the, uh, the other riskiest portions we get is, uh, you'll see an owner that says, well, we get all ownership property rights, rights to use, uh, reproduce your documents. Instead, for what you wanna do in negotiation is, give a royalty-free, non-exclusive license. So basically they can use the documents and your instruments of service for a particular project. Anything else they need to get your permission for. We, we want to see written authorization. Um, and if they want to do that, usually then you can um, ask for an additional fee uh, on top of what your fee is for your base services in your contract. I really like that because that comes up a lot. And I get this question a lot and it doesn't, it doesn't play as big into insurance if if only from um, like a manufacturing standpoint. You know, if I have a structural engineer up in Oregon who designs widgets and they're a million dollars and, um, you know, the company he was working with wanted him to design this, but then they want to be able to sell that widget to as many people as possible, right? We're, we run into a, an exponent there of of how, where, where this thing is put out into the world and how much control we have over it. And so an ownership of documents uh, clause is really, really important for something like that. Absolutely, and, and Liam made a good point there that ties into our next slide, which is ownership uh, should absolutely be tied to payment. Um, so payment terms, you know, the first two bullet points here are obviously pretty obvious, you know, what are payment terms and why are they important? You know, it's the reason that you're you're doing what you're doing outside of your you know love for your profession. Uh, you know, your firm needs to get paid. So generally, uh, the contract review guide gives some sort of best practices in terms of you know how long it takes to get paid, uh, interest accruing. You want that to be as those terms to be as clear as as possible. And then you also want to have the ability to collect that and have some leverage on that front. Um, you know, the first thing I look at when a client comes to me with a payment dispute is I see if there's a prevailing party attorney fees clause, because if there is, then that means that we have leverage to go after this, this money that's owed to us and recover our attorney's fees. Um, you know, if you have a $20,000 outstanding bill, but it's going to cost $15,000 to collect it, that's not a ton of value to you. So, um, you know, the prevailing party attorney's fees issue is uh, a complicated one and brokers and attorneys often differ on it and it's, <laughs> it's beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, but I just, I, I did want to make that clear. And then I just, the, the thing that I think I see more and more, uh, you know, looking at 20, 25 contracts a week for design professionals, this idea of payment withholding and offset, um, Owners uh, of all kinds, large and small, are essentially squeezing design professionals by saying that if they just have a, a reasonable, good faith belief that you may have made some mistake that could hypothetically in the future damage them, they get to stop paying you. Um, it's completely unfair. It's completely unreasonable. And the contract guide gives you uh, some ways that you can push back on that. Um, Generally, you want to make sure that any withholding is tied to some specific uh, allegation that you did something wrong, so some specific error or omission. Uh, that's the first part. And then the second part is you want to force the owner to tell you what you did wrong, put it in writing, and give you an opportunity to cure that perceived deficiency before any right to withholding 
uh, arises. Those are those are the biggest things. But I I can't tell you, um, you know, the last two or three years, I get into more fights about this uh, than almost anything. Um, and uh, like I tell uh, like I tell clients, my my clients' clients, when I'm trying to negotiate these. When you stop paying a design professional, all you're doing is escalating the dispute. It doesn't it doesn't de-escalate anything. It makes you more likely to get involved in a claim. Um, so it's for everyone's best interest that you know we'll keep providing the services, you keep paying us, and you know we'll resolve we'll resolve our differences once we have a successfully completed project. It's a really important point to touch on, and I will say, in the last what eighteen months, almost two years, we're we're into this uh, coronavirus, COVID pandemic. When money becomes an issue for clients, these types of of uh, problems escalate even higher, right? If if I, the client, have run out of money, and I still need to pay you, Mr. and Mrs. Architect and I don't have the money to pay you, it's a very easy, not necessarily you know, ethical, but easy thing to point and say, well, I think that you, you know, made an error here and therefore we'll just call it even, right? I, I just don't have to pay you for it. And, it's like, and, and as Steve just said, that's not how it works, but that is a huge exposure for our design professionals and it is increasing. It has gotten worse over the past 18 months, two years. It's absolutely right. All right. Chapter okay. six. All right. Uh, this could be like a series of like 10 hour long presentations <laughs> on indemnity and defense. So uh, keep that in mind. You've got three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> on the clock. Go. <laughs> we, we can do it. Okay. First, this is, I mean, we're going to look at it from the perspective of just kind of big picture do's and don'ts and how this ties into uh, coverage. One, you, your defense, the, the defense and indemnity, we don't want defense. No defense. If you see the word defend, take it out. That, that should not be in there. The reason is because the way the law treats defense and indemnity is um, it does two things at once. It elides them and treats them the same, but in some circumstances, it treats them differently. So if you have an obligation to, to defend someone per your contract, that it doesn't matter if you're liable or not. You could be the A-plus perfect design professional on that project, but if you have an obligation to defend and there's a claim against your, the client who you owe a defense to, you're, you might have to pay all their attorney's fees and costs of defense which makes no sense because you're not liable and did nothing wrong, but that's how the law treats it. And it's because you agreed to it under your contract. No defense. Two, uh, if your indemnity obligation is, is broader than covering just uh, your negligence, right? Indemnity in your contract needs to be tied to your professional negligence. If it's tied to anything beyond that or in excess of that, you will run into coverage problems and you're going to call Zach and call me or Steve and have a, start asking a lot of questions of what well, is this covered? What, what happened? So you know more than professional negligence. Okay. Is what your indemnity needs to be tied to. Next is uh, what does the law say on this? Well, there's a civil code section that's actually really, really beneficial to design professionals. And it, it makes your indemnity obligation only in proportion to your comparative fault. So before this, um, this new law was, came into effect in 2018, before what you would see is you'd owe an indemnity or defense obligation except for the circumstances where of where there's sole negligence by the party that you, you had to defend or indemnify, which was still terrible because you could have, uh, you know, 1% fault and 99% fault on the person you're indemnifying, but now it's not sole negligence. And that 1% fault is going to trigger all that indemnity and defense obligation. So this is along with the standard of care and perhaps a little more, this is the most riskiest, part of your contract. It has a ton of cover coverage implications. 
lights alarms start flashing when you start reading this and you pay a lot of attention and you probably if you have any questions you start calling zach or you call me or steve if you about it i'll hand it to zach because i know you i can tell you want to talk about this well it's it's so important so so important here if if only because this upfront defense cost that you just articulated is uninsurable right? It's not meant to be insured. It's an upfront defense cost. It's almost the equivalent of having to give somebody money so they can turn around and sue you. It makes no sense whatsoever. What makes it bad for design professionals though, is that the contractor's general liability policy does have some coverage for this, right? They do, they are able to provide this upfront defense cost. So this, the Senate bill that you're talking, the, the civil code, which was Senate bill 496 when it was passed, was this big fight between uh, design professionals and politicians and contractors because politicians said, hey, look, contractors can pay for it. And it's like, well, that's written into their language. We could do a whole other seminar on why that is. But just know as a design professional, this is not insurable. So if it is in there, if you do see that word defend in there, think I'm going to have to write that check if something goes wrong. My insurance company is not going to pick that up. And that's not that's not a good thing. So. Right. And it took decades of, of lobbying and legislation through the AIA and ACEC and, and firms like, like Liam and mine uh, to get that, get that law passed. And um, we're already seeing uh, kind of creative developers and attorneys chipping away at Civil Code 2782.8 um, by trying to reverse, the, reverse the, uh, the way that it operates and just doing a bunch of of different tricky things to, to get around it. So, right. um, yeah, that, that's a, a topic in and of itself. Um, and I'm sure we'll have questions at it, about it at the end. Um, but for now, uh, let's jump to chapter seven, which I'll just touch on quickly. Your contract, if your contract is silent as to uh, dispute resolution, then the default is your constitutional right to a jury trial. The only way that you uh, give that up is is by contract. So if your contract has uh, arbitration provision, if your contract requires some other type of dispute resolution, uh, that's the only way that you can change it. Otherwise, your constitutional rights apply. Um, I inserted what I'm calling a bonus slide here because I feel like there is some some confusion and I want to I want to try to educate and, and improve our, our dispute resolution literacy a little bit. So a mediation is different than a trial or an arbitration. A mediation is a completely voluntary process. Uh, no one makes a decision. Um, you know, you're not obligated to do anything. It's utilizing a neutral third party to see whether you can come together and settle a dispute, but no decisions are made. And I want to contrast that with trials, which you know, I'm using I'm using graphics here, and I apologize for the the clip art. But a trial is what you think of um, when you think about a, a you know a, a TV show. You're in front of a judge and jury, and a jury of your peers is deciding: Did you fall below the standard of care in the provision of your services? So that's one hand. That is what your contract will default to unless you agree to something else. Uh, arbitration is the other option. This is the other option where a decision is actually made, and the only difference is that you're sitting in fr- in, in a conference room. And in, in my graphic here, the, uh, the man or woman in green is going to be listening to both sides. You present your evidence the same way you would in a trial. Um, and that, that individual or panel of individuals would, uh, it will make the decision. But um, I just want, want to just that quick overview on mediation versus litigation, which is trial on the left there versus arbitration. Uh, because I think that those terms get confused a lot. And, um, you know, typically best practice, as far as we're concerned, is we want to mediate first to see if we can resolve something before we, um, you know, before we move into litigation or arbitration. So before we go to trial or before we go in front of this arbitrator, who's typically a retired uh, judge or attorney who's going to going to make a ruling and the pros and cons of each uh, we'd be happy to talk about in uh, another hour long seminar <laughs> right. another time. But, but those are the, um, those are kind of the high points. And then I know, you know, Zach, you, I'm sure uh, push your clients towards mediation where at all possible in their contract. 
Yes, mediation where at all possible. Uh, coverage standpoint, your insurance policy, your professional liability insurance policy may have a deductible credit for going to mediation first. Mediation deductible credit, meaning uh, sometimes it's going to depend on the carrier, it's going to depend on the coverage. Uh, if you had a $50,000 deductible and you went to mediation, there might be a 50% mediation deductible credit, meaning that you would only have to pay 25000 of your deductible if you got it to go to mediation first. So definitely trying to incentivize incentivize that uh, because it's going to potentially save a lot of folks a lot of time and money. So, we're, I see we're, we right. got some questions building up here. We're, we'll get through just two more topics here, guys, and then we'll uh, we'll jump into all the questions. Um, I know we're trying to we're trying to hit it at a high level, and then we want to be able to go deep into your questions here. So we'll wrap this up. In just a minute. Yeah. Yeah, I was just about to say, I, we're not ignoring the chat. We see you, chat. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> give, I'm, give, give us, I'm normally better on top give, of it, but this one's a fun one. We're, we're doing a back and forth here. So, But I've, one of the questions in here was, what are your opinions of limitations of liability? So right uh, on in. <laughs> yes, more. All, all the time, every time. Uh, right. um, limit, so limitations of liability, we'll do it real quick. Yes, please. Yes, they're enforceable as long as the other side uh, against whom you will enforce limitation of liability had a chance to negotiate. What does negotiate mean? Did you send them the contract and they got a chance to look at it before they signed it? Okay, now it's enforceable. That's negotiate. Um, how, and how do you negotiate it? Well, uh, a starting point is, uh, is usually one of two things. Let's have the limitation of liability be the total amount of fees paid for services. And the way you can articulate that is, well, that way it's a fair and reasonable parallel uh, between our risk and what we were paid. They, those two, if they are congruent, that just makes sense as far as a compromise is concerned. The next, the next one, so that'd be better because that fee is almost certainly going to be less than the second option is let's make the limitation of liability the amount of insurance available on the policy that will participate at the time the claim is made. Um, that way, now your limitation of liability is to whatever the available insurance was at the time that the claim is made. So the idea with the limitation of liability is as best we can uh, at least uh, prevent any potential liability that may exceed the limits of your policy, right? Uh, so that way, at least you have a ceiling and it gives a great peace of mind in terms of risk management of there's, I'm not going to have to go out of pocket for this claim. Right. So, right. Really important. I, and another discount available uh, on the policy, depending on the insurance carrier, obviously depending on the policy, but if you can get a certain percentage and oftentimes it's 50% uh, or more of your contracts with a limit limitation of liability to a specific dollar amount of fees or a, a just a, a standard dollar amount or at least uh, insurance proceeds available, which is different than your policy limit, right? If you have $5 million policy, you had a million dollar claim, only $4 million is available. So we say uh, insurance proceeds available, um, but you can get a discount of 10, 15% on your insurance policy. And the only other thing there, um, really, really important to know that you can only limit your liability with first parties, right? So as you're talking about third parties, if I was, uh, you know, I think of the Berkeley, Berkeley balcony collapse that happened about seven years ago now. Um, if something like that tragic were to happen, people who are involved uh, that were not involved party to the contract aren't subject to the limitation of liability. Really important point to know. Very important. So... So um, one extra, just quick, quick bonus slide. The 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 seminal law that that made the limitations of liability um, in these design professional contracts enforceable uh, was actually argued by one of uh, Steve and I's uh, longtime colleagues that we still work with, uh, named Sam Muir. And and up on the screen here, you see the case. It's called Mark Burrow, California Inc. Um, uh, versus uh, Superior Court of Riverside County. It's, the, the the court wasn't sued. That's just the the way the law, <laughs> the the cases look. But just to give you an example, there there was this huge reservoir built. It leaked. It caused tens of millions of dollars in damages. 
the contract at issue had a limitation of liability for $50,000 in it, I think, or, or the fee that the engineer was paid. And so there's a, you know, multi, 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 multi million dollar claim limitation of liability for around 50,000, which was the engineer's fee. And the court was like, yep, enforceable. You should have read your contract that and the contract at issue here was a standard form agreement printed on two sided paper with the terms and conditions on the backside written in like eight point font, uh, and with the limitation of liability in there, of course, was like, well, did you send it to them? Like, yeah. They're like, and you, you got it? Yeah. Well, did you read it? I don't know. Well, it doesn't matter. You had a chance to negotiate it. Enforced. So, uh, Sam, that, that argued this case, both at the trial level and the appellate level, um, still works with us a lot. And this is uh, just awesome that we, we get to work with him. But also, we've got limitation liability, thanks to thanks to him. So. There you go. That's the Mark Burrow story. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make chapter nine here very quick. Uh, the same way that if you see workmanlike and, uh, you know, free from defects, your antenna should go up about potentially having a contract, uh, you know, a contractor agreement in front of you. Um, same is true of warranties, guarantees, and to a certain extent, certification. The word certify can be okay in certain circumstances but design professionals do not warrant or guarantee their work and they are not insured to do so. Um, so if you see those words, um, you need, you know that that contract needs some work. Yep. And now that I see 29 questions in the chat box, I am going to move us along here. Um, right. and Zach, I'll let you uh, kind of moderate this. Perfect. Perfect. So we're going to hop into questions here. So just know again, um, we have the contract guide. It's going to be sent out to everybody after this. It's going to go through all of these chapters here. Um, happy to answer any questions that we don't get to. Just send me an email. Um, and then we'll also have a special offer that's going out in the email as well. If you're looking to work with uh, Steve, uh, Liam, or myself, if you need to get a contract reviewed, um, we, have, we have something special just for the folks that are on the call today. So with that, we're going to jump in. I'm going to start from the beginning. Um, what am I, a lot of public clients require us to be the best, otherwise we won't be selected. That's back to standard of care. Yeah, it's tough. It's kind of what we were talking about with the marketing, right? It's like, how do you prove that you're really good at what you do, but stay within the standard of care? Um, I don't have a great answer for that, to be honest. Do you guys have anything? I mean, other than, you know, yeah. I try to, I try to educate and escalate with public entities because right. they're they're very top down uh you want to tell them okay you know uh, I'll, I'll sign this contract but i want to make sure you and your boss and your boss's boss knows what you're asking us to sign right which is some lawyer wrote you a contract that's very one-sided in your favor but you're going to write yourself out of coverage and you're going to be left without an insurance policy to cover a claim so you're kind of outsmarting yourself. And I find that if you, you know, and it kind of takes a group effort, um, you know, you're always going to have you know, certain firms that might be more willing to, to accept that risk than others. But the more we present a united front in, in telling them, hey, you're, you're making us sign a contract that's not insurable, the better we're going to, you know, keep pushing back. And, and then I also find that um, citing to the civil code saying, you know, we can only be responsible for our own, you know, negligence and to the extent that it's proven, um, that's, that's another way to do it. Keeping in mind that that provision does not apply to agencies of the state of California, which uh, were nice enough to exempt themselves from the rule when it was right. written into law. Right. Agencies of California by far going to be the hardest uh, folks to negotiate with or, you know, public agencies in general. Um, and, and that is just kind of one of the factors I would think when taking on public work that you're going to have to, to be able to you know, keep in mind. So, um, What about a design build firm? Do they need a combined contract and or separate liability insurances? I'll punt that to you guys first. What do you think about design build uh, and, and setting up a contract for a design build? So, so um, for design build, uh, a lot of times you'll see the um, the DBIA forms, um, either, you know, I think it's, what is it, the 540 or 530, depending on if it's, um, you're the prime designer or a sub-consultant. Um, 
And so that contract will contain all, all the terms that, that AIA, well, not all, but it, it's similar to AIA and that it will have the same perspective, uh, whether it's for a subconsultant or a subcontractor, it keeps that division between contractors and design professionals. So if you're using one of those DBIA contracts, you should be okay with the, the standard language in terms of most of these, this stuff. You just look for the, the changes that the, um, the client would have made that, that could in- affect you know, all the issues that we touched on today. Uh, and then you would, d- depending on if you're the actual design builder, right? If you're a, a, a firm that does mix of uh, engineering and, and contracting, you would carry all, all the typical insurance that, that both the contractor and um, design professional would carry. So you'd have CGL, PL policies. Um, anything else that might be required for, uh, in the contract if it's beyond the, the, the standard coverage that you would have. Right. And from an insurance standpoint, there are a select few number of carriers that want to take on that exposure of design build, though it is becoming more and more popular. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, we would want those policies to talk to each other to exclude uh, each other where, where it makes sense. And we definitely want to let our insurance companies know that we are doing design build work. So that's, that's a really important one. Uh, on an, and that, that's usually on an insurance application. So, Yeah, and in that integrated, integrated project delivery model, to the extent that you can have your contract speak to, you know, construction separately from design and, and make clear that certain of the, the promises you're making in the contract do not apply to the, you know, your, your scope of design services, that's another way just to make sure that you are, are separating the two enough to ensure that there's coverage. All right, absolutely. Uh, next question, do you need to contact insurance company when prior to negotiating with clients? Um, no, you don't need to contact your insurance company. Um, you can absolutely contact me, your broker, or uh, Stephen Liam, your attorneys, if you're trying to negotiate something specific and you have a question. Uh, that's one of the services that we love to provide kind of in our risk management uh, bundle that we put together. Um, is to be able to walk you through stuff like that, especially if it's tricky stuff or if it's new, right? If it's something that's new to you and you've never done it before, never a bad idea to pick up the phone and call one of us and say, hey, you know, if I've never done public work and I'm negotiating with a public entity, yeah, I probably want to get a little bit of help there. Um, But you're under no requirement to contact the insurance company uh, when negotiating. Um... It says, every single company I have worked with in the last uh, almost 40 years deletes the arbitration option in the AIA contracts. Why does the AIA keep it in? Interesting. So the answer is that it it keeps it in as an option. Um, You know, you have to check a box and and, um, sort of elect to do that. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to, uh, it's being, this is being recorded. So I'm not going to make any kind of allegations that the American arbitration association or jams or any of these other administrators or any retired judges or attorneys who are serving as these arbitrators have a vested financial interest in, in it continuing. Um, but I, I can't help but think that that is, is a possibility. Um, uh, you know, my personal preference, uh, having, you know, litigated on behalf of, of design professionals is that you should avoid arbitration uh, at all costs. Uh, the efficiencies are overstated. Uh, the arbitrator uh, does not have to follow the law. Uh, there's no right to appeal. And you give up your constitutional right to a jury trial and uh, a jury of your peers. Uh, architects and engineers are some of the most well-respected and well-liked uh, professions on the planet. They're typically in the top five, um, unlike contractors. And unfortunately, uh, people like Liam and myself, we tend to be in the bottom five. Um, so why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you want a jury? Uh, why wouldn't you want a jury that already respects your perfection, profession and, and uh, appreciates what you do? Why wouldn't you want them deciding your fate instead of an arbitrator who has a vested financial interest in being there? Yeah, very, very good point. Arbitration known for uh, splitting the baby, if we will, and just chopping things up 30, 33, 33, 33. It's 33% Liam's fault, 33% Zach, 33% Steven. When, you know, Liam is, a, is an engineer and would do very well in front of uh, a court and didn't, you know, by our standards, have a whole lot to do with anything going wrong there. So, 
and one of one other note is uh, despite the the suite of contracts coming from the AIA, contractors have a lot of input and, and seat at the table on how those contracts are put together. So um, it's a little bit of a you can we have a misconception that this is a purely architect or design professional driven suite of contracts when in fact it's actually more of a collaboration that involves contractors and other stakeholders. It's a really important point, actually. When we think of AIA documents, yeah, we think of them not necessarily written in the best interests of the design professional, right? Kind of written more middle of the road, um, which is, and I, and I would argue too that they are meant to be amended in your favor, right? Or they're 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 a draft. They're meant to be a template that you start with, not necessarily a, a plug and play. Um. Doesn't California public contract code prohibit a limitation of liability? Hmm. Not to my I, knowledge. But. Yeah, not, not to my knowledge. There may be certain limitations um, in terms of the, the scope of a limitation, but um, as, as far as as far as I'm aware, you can uh, you can limit your liability even out to a, a, a public agency. Right. It might, you might be, uh, you might have very few options as to what they'll accept, if anything, but I don't know if it's written in a code or not, but I wouldn't, I can't say that definitively. So, um, yeah, right. and I, if I, anyone I, were violating the statute, it would be them by not following the public right. contract code. You, you know, right. you could, you're free to propose, you know, whatever you want. Liam, did you have something? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I don't think I haven't seen that in there. It, you may be, if you're getting, if you're engaging with public entities, that might be some sort of negotiating tactic they use where they're kind of making a squishy gray area argument um, right. about potentially other areas of the public contract code, but um, not, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. We, I will definitely say it's hard. It is not easy to negotiate with a public entity. But we've had clients come back, actually clients that have worked with, with Stephen Liam, and say, hey, I was told later on after the project that I got more changed in my contract than they typically would, right? Which is nice. So we, we'll, we'll hang that up as a W. It doesn't always work out the, exactly the way that we want. But um, anytime we can get more done than most other people, that's always a good thing. Um, is a limitation enforceable in all 50 states? It's an interesting question. Uh, there is a, there's a, if you Google it, there's a survey of, um, someone has put together a survey of all 50 states, uh, what types of indemnity are enforceable, whether a limitation of liability is enforceable. Um, Liam and I are, are only licensed to advise on legal issues in, in California that you know, we, we provide general risk management advice to um, clients in, in all 50 states and around the world, but um, uh, that question we just have to look at on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, yeah. The answer is that it, it varies state-by-state, state, though. Right. The, the, each state varies so widely in their statute of limitation, statute of repose, in the way that they handle each things individually, and some states are more favorable than others, but um, that would be a tough one to answer in a single sentence. One one other thing to touch on on this point is you can look you 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 can look for the choice of law provisions in your contract uh, towards the end in like a section usually titled miscellaneous or additional provisions or something like that you'll have choice of law that'll say uh, this law this contract shall be interpreted and enforced pursuant to the laws of blank it'll either have a state or it'll have um, language like the, uh, the venue or county or state where the project is located. So just in terms of a legal issue on, well, what does the law say about this issue or this issue or this issue? You want to look to that choice of law provision in your contract as the starting point, because that's what Steve or I would do if we got it, got it and, and came across something that, that was potentially out of state or not California law. Gotcha. All right, we got one more here. Um, I think we'll be right on time. It is, what is your opinion of the standard EJCDC agreement? I, I personally have not dealt with it in too much depth. Have you, Liam? No, I don't think so. Me... Um, so EJCDC engineering joint I'm blanking on the rest of the the yeah. acronym, but similar to AIA, right, for engineers. Uh, from my understanding, I've seen a few of them. Um, 
meant to be a template, right? Meant to be meant to be a, a draft like we're talking about. Meant to be uh, manipulated by the person sending it out, and so you always want to review them. Um, I do think that they were they were created by committee, uh, like the AA documents that we're talking about. Um, I I've heard you know good things, but it depends on which one which one you're talking about in particular, because like the AA documents, they're numbered and they're meant to be for specific situations. Um, but in general, I think AIA and, and EJ CDC are the two entities that design professionals would turn to for uh, taking a template of a standard agreement, right? Um, that being said, shameless plug, I would I would 100% have Stephen Liam take a look at your agreement, help you write your agreement. They have done that for a number of my clients. Um, it it is worth its weight in gold because as a risk manager, we cannot talk about your risk without first taking a look at the contract that you're signing or your standard agreement that you're getting uh, signed by by your clients. So, um, and that's part of our offer. I'll send that in the follow-up, but happy to take a look at working with anybody. We're about a minute over and I don't see any more questions in there. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and say thank you for, for everyone. Uh, Cindy, how do you get a copy of the guide? I will be sending an email. Uh, you'll get that today. It's going to be a link to go ahead and download uh, the guide. And that's it's also on our website, BlackSwan-Risk Management. Um, like I said, if you have any other questions, feel free to shoot us a note. Shoot us, uh, um, you know, if you got value from this, we'd, we would love that if you shared it with your team. If you have team members like, let's say, new principals or new project managers that might find this type of training valuable, we can absolutely set that up as well. Uh, but really, really appreciate your time. And Liam and Steve, thank you guys so much. This was, this was excellent. This was a great walkthrough, and, and I think it was really valuable. Yeah, thank you for having us. Appreciate it, Zach, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Absolutely. If yeah. you have feedback as well, uh, as, as everybody's fallen off, please feel free to send us your feedback. We're always trying to make these better, uh, clearer, um, and, and just easier to digest. So wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it.